Good morning. This is your first lecture for week number two, and today's going to be Ancient Egypt. Now, just a quick note. Uh, I hope everybody got their week one work in. If you have any questions or anything, just email, or you can always come by my office here in Carrollton whenever you would like. Um, for Ancient Egypt here, Let's talk about the beginnings of Egypt. Where, where does it come from? Where does it start? And whenever you talk about Egypt, you have to talk about the Nile River. I've got a picture here of the Nile River, and it flows from the south to the north. So it starts down in Lake Victoria, and it flows north until it gets to the Mediterranean Sea. And depending on where you measure it from, it's about 4,000 miles. Um, there are some questions on where exactly the beginning of the Nile is. Some people say Lake Albert, some people say Lake Victoria, um, but either way, it's in the Great Lakes region of Africa. The Nile proper starts with the Blue Nile and the White Nile. Uh, the White Nile is longer, but the Blue Nile supplies most of the water. And then near the city of Khartoum, which is in Sudan, and that's where it comes together to become the Nile River. Now, this Nile River is really, really important because that's where the Egyptians get most of their agricultural ability from. Um, the Nile River, it floods very predictably. Every year, they can tell when it's going to flood, what's going to happen. And when the Nile River overflows its banks, it's going to put down nutrients in the soil that can then be used to do agriculture. If it wasn't for the Nile and if it wasn't for these floods, uh, the Egyptians would not have had enough food to survive and become as powerful as they were. The Nile is used for things other than food. Uh, for example, it's a river, so there's transportation. Even today, the Nile River is heavily used for transportation, lots of boats on the Nile River. It was also used for papyrus. Papyrus is a reed, and if you dry out the reed, you can unravel it, and it creates a sort of paper. And this paper is going to let the Egyptians write down their history, which is why we know so much about them. And then there's gonna be food, of course. You've got birds and fish, and frogs and other small things that you would find along the water side or the river bank. And the Egyptians would use those sources of food to go along with their agriculture. Another thing that people do when they talk about Egypt is to divide it up into periods. And I like to do the pre-dynastic period the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and then the New Kingdom. So of those, we'll start with the pre-dynastic because it is the oldest. And this period, 3500 to about 2800 BC, depending on who you ask and who you talk to, those numbers can be a little bit different, but this will get you in the right neighborhood. Now, when the pre-dynastic period starts, Egypt is divided into different kingdoms, different cities of power, if you will. Uh, for example, the Upper Kingdom, it was near the city of Luxor. Um, and then that's near where all the, uh, the pyramids and everything are today. And then the Lower Kingdom is in the Nile Delta, where the city of Alexandria is today. It's during this pre-dynastic period that the Egyptians learn to use advanced tools, they learn their early agriculture, and their culture is going to unite. Uh, there's a legendary king named Narmer, also known as Menes, depending on what the source is. Uh, but it's Narmer who's going to unite the upper kingdom and the lower kingdom together. And during this pre-dynastic period, the Egyptians are also going to explore. 
and they're going to explore over 600 miles of the Nile River and become well established during that. And then uh, the pre dynastic period is where you're going to get the start of Egyptian religion, too. After the pre dynastic period, we get the Old Kingdom. And once again, rough estimates 2800 to 2100 BC. So the Old Kingdom is going to last around 700 to 750 years. Um, and this is going to happen. Once again, because Narmer unites Upper and Lower Egypt, and he's going to become the head of the first dynasty. And it's really important to know that these are not pharaohs. These are going to be just kings that are really, really powerful. The pharaohs are going to come later. Um, they have almost absolute power. In reality, the old kingdom it's a monopoly that is run by the king. The royal monopoly, everybody works for the king. Uh, the officials work for the king, the artisans, the peasants, the slaves, everybody works for the king. It's a very thorough or a very well thought out government. Uh, there are governors of provinces, there are local mayors, there are tax collectors, and everybody answers to the king. There's a lot of trade, uh, the artisans, the peasants, they all make things or grow food and then they trade it with neighbors and then all of the money made from that comes back to the king. And one of the people that they trade with is the kingdom of Nubia. Uh, that would be today, uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia. And because of this trade between the kingdom of Nubia and the old kingdom of Egypt, the Old Kingdom had a very stable and very good economy. The Egyptians, for the time, of course, they were not hurting for money. And if you ever want to know exactly how powerful these kings were, you just have to look at the pyramids. Uh, the pyramids, which you got a picture of there, that's a pure symbol of power, if you will. Now, just a side note, that's the most famous picture of the pyramids right there, where it looks like they're out in the middle of nowhere. But in reality, if you turn around and you look with your back to those pyramids, there's a large modern day city there. So uh, don't, don't let Hollywood fool you. Now, if you look at these, uh, they're made out of giant blocks. There's something like two and a half million stone blocks, each one weighing two and a half tons. Um, if you figure a ton is 1,200 pounds or so, we're looking about 3,000 pounds per rock. So you got two and a half ton stones, two and a half million of them being placed into these pyramid shapes. Now, what were these pyramids? They were tombs. The largest pyramid is the tomb of the great Khufu. And it said that it took something like 25 years to build his temple. These pyramids are perfect geometric shapes. And they used to be covered in a bright, shiny limestone and if you look at the one pyramid right here, you can still see the top of it has a little bit of the limestone covering left. Another interesting thing about these pyramids, archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, we all used to think that it was done by slave labor, but it turns out that these were actually done by paid workers. Payment stubs, or check stubs, if you will, have been located. They were paid in food, they were paid in money, and they were paid in beer. And the workers lived in caves and in housing off-site but nearby. And another interesting thing is historians and archaeologists have found some of the earliest graffiti 
in these caves where workers were displeased with their bosses. The Old Kingdom religion is what people think of when it comes to Egyptian religion. Their religion was polytheistic, meaning that there were multiple gods or multiple deities, and it was circular. It was all based on the cycle of nature. Now, I have listed here some of the primary gods. Uh, Geb was the earth, Nat was the sky, Ra or Amun, they're the same deity, that was the sun god. Osiris was the god of the afterlife. Isis, the god of fertility. Then when you come to Horus, it's a little weird. It's the son of Isis and Osiris, or it was the brother of Osiris, or maybe it was both. We don't really know. Set was evil. Anubis is the god of the underworld, and Toph is the god of knowledge. Now, Ra is considered the most important god. Osiris, once again, he's the god that rules over the dead. Uh, he was originally the god of fertility, though. And it said that Osiris gave Egypt its laws and taught the people how to be prosperous. But Osiris was murdered by Horus, who, once again, is either his son or his... Um, his brother. So we've got Osiris who's dead, Horus has killed him, cut his body up, and then Isis, who is the wife of Osiris, reassembles him and then resurrects him. And that's why he becomes the god of the afterlife. There are other gods who have lower positions in Egyptian theology. These other gods appear in various forms. Most often they're going to appear as animals. And then these lesser gods are thought to be local deities for villages up and down the Nile River. Now the Egyptians, they believe in an afterlife and they believed that their afterlife was very pleasant. And it was thought that when Egyptians died, if they had been successful in their life, that they would go on and they would perform their usual tasks in the afterlife, but they would be even more successful. So their king, who was already <clears throat> powerful, would become even more powerful. Uh, priests and government administrators would hold more responsible positions in the afterlife. And for everyone who lived a good life on Earth, there would be pleasures such as boating, duck hunting. And then because they thought they would live beyond the afterlife, they made very careful preparations for the physical needs of the afterlife. So their tombs were filled with their favorite possessions. The tombs are filled with jewelry, uh, cups of wine, sometimes even animals, statues of the people, and even their servants. If the, somebody was wealthy enough to have servants, the servants could be buried with them. Now the bodies are embalmed uh, and mummified. They're preserved because it's thought that after they come back, basically during the afterlife, they would re-inhabit their bodies. Their sarcophagus is painted to look similar to them because if the body's damaged, then they can inhabit the sarcophagus. And as a last resort, the statues in the tombs of the kings will be used as a house or a home for their spirits in case both the body and the sarcophagus were destroyed. The Book of the Dead very famous. Uh, the Book of the Dead provides all the burial instructions and the Book of the Dead is going to have all the details on how to get to the afterlife. Basically they thought it was a game. You had to beat the game to get to the afterlife. The heart was supposed to be weighed and if it weighed more than a feather 
then you had to pass a judgment. If your heart weighed less than a feather, then you were able to go to the afterlife without any problems. Um, and then, of course, everybody's heart weighs more than a feather. So to get to the afterlife, you had to pass tests. You had to play games. And if you did not win the game and make it to the afterlife, then your soul was eaten by the great devourer. Another part of religion, and this is kind of philosophy too at the same time, uh, it's this idea of mat, M-A-A-T, or sometimes you see it M-A apostrophe A-T. But mat, it's this abstract ethical quality. Um, Egyptologists today, they translate it roughly to right order. And mat only exists if everything was in the order that the gods had ordained. If the Egyptians were doing what they thought the gods needed and wanted, um, this concept of mat would come into being. And it was like this harmonizing force that arranged all things into the right relationship. Um, right order is the best way to put them. Now, Matt is going to illustrate a couple of different things that are important. Uh, number one, it's going to show how religion, not control, but influence these ancient Egyptians. Because Matt doesn't exist unless all the gods are happy. At the same time, though, the kings would use Matt to keep everything in order. Um, the kings would say, Matt won't exist unless you do what the government says, what the king says is right. So it also shows how religion can be used as a tool of politics, too. <clears throat> Ancient Egyptian writing. Uh, hieroglyphics, you've probably heard of this before, um, but just in case you've never seen it, uh, there's a picture here of some examples. And what's really cool about hieroglyphics is we can read it. In the year 1798, the French army was trying to invade and conquer Egypt, and none other than Napoleon was in charge of this army. While they were going through the Sahara, they find the Rosetta Stone, which was a three-sided pillar. And this Rosetta Stone was thought to be created around 200 BC. And one side had hieroglyphs. One side had something called demonic. And demonic was basically shorthand, Greek, or shorthand. And then on the third side is Greek. So you've got Greek translation to demonic, and then from the demonic, you can get the full hieroglyphs. Uh, the Greek was translated by 1802. The demonic was translated in 1814. <clears throat> and then shortly after that, the full blown hieroglyphics were discovered. And hieroglyphics, it's a language that really works as three different languages in one. When you break down hieroglyphics, uh, there are three different parts. There's phonograms, ideograms, and determinism. The phonograms are when the signs represent sound, like a mouth. You look here, this mouth, it stood for the sound an R would make. But then you have the ideograms. Ideograms is when the sign represents an idea. So even though this is just a circle, the idea behind it is mouth, while the phonogram is an R. The determinative is unspoken. They're basically going to give context clues into whether you should be looking at the idea or the, the picture. And there were no vowels in hieroglyphics. 
Now, if that's not difficult enough, hieroglyphics could be written in any direction, up, down, left, right, backwards, forward. The way you knew which direction to read hieroglyphics had to do with the way the faces were pointing. So if the face was looking towards the right, you start on the left and you read towards the right. If the face is on the right looking left, then you read it backwards. Now with this writing, with the hieroglyphs, Egyptians, they developed a rich literature. Uh, a lot of their work is dealt, deals with their myths and their afterlife. Uh, they have hymns to their various gods. They have poems celebrating victories by kings. And they have victories about overcoming death. They also have stories about their gods. And they have different proverbs, too. Now, as I said before, the Book of the Dead is one of the most important pieces of literature they had. That's what made sure that they could transfer to the afterlife and have their burials and structures and everything. Their wisdom books would have advice on loyalty. They would have advice on what to do, what not to do, and how to be a good Egyptian. They also write about two different ideas, one called the Ba, B-A, which meant their personality, and Ka, K-A, their essence or their soul. So they would write about those items as well. Egyptians were pioneers in applied science. Um, because they depended so heavily on the Nile, they had to carefully plan what they were going to do for planting with all the silt. And they had the master arithmetic, geometry, and surveying to make sure that they could plan for the floods and how to use the land to its fullest potential. The pyramids are going to, they show how the Egyptians can actually apply mathematical principles and scientific principles into a building. Once again, it is a perfect geometric shape. For medicine, um, Egyptian medicine depended largely on driving beings out of the body. Um, but even so, the Egyptians, they worked at diagnosing different illnesses, even though sometimes it was wrong. Uh, they identified 48 different types of medical problems. <clears throat> These medical problems were divided into three classes. One class would be curable diseases. A second class being uh, treatment will be suffering. And a third one basically don't bother. Uh, you know, treatments where you can cure, treatments where you can make comfortable, or treatments to make passing easier. <clears throat> Now, the Old Kingdom does come to an end, and uh, we're not 100% sure why. Uh, somewhere starting around 2100 BC, uh, we think that there was famine, uh, there wasn't enough food to eat, and then a civil war broke out, and then there's a lack of foreign trade. The last king of the Old period is known as Pepsis II, and after that, uh, we go into the Middle Kingdom, which exists from around 2000 to 1720 BC. <clears throat> Egypt is going to be reunified by a, a person named Mentu Hotep. And Mentu Hotep II, he's going to be the one that declares the kings to be living gods. So it's Mentu Hotep II when he unifies the Middle Kingdom after all this famine and after all the civil war. He's going to be the one who creates this idea that pharaohs are gods. Under Mentu Hotep, the government's going to be reestablished. Uh, there's going to be regional administration again. 
and the kingdom of Nubia is going to be conquered by Egypt. Now, around 1720, a group of people known as the Pictos, they're going to invade Egypt. And scholars, we're still not sure where these Pictos came from. Some people say they came from Asia. Some people say they came from South or Southern Africa. Uh, probably they came from somewhere around modern-day Syria or modern-day Turkey. The Hyksos, they bring with them horses, bows and arrows, axes, and they're able to conquer the Middle Kingdom. And from about 1720 until around 1570, the Hyksos are in charge. But when we get to 1570, the Egyptians, led by a, a guy named Amos the First, are going to defeat the Hyksos and throw them out. And when the Hyksos are thrown out, that begins the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom roughly 1570 to 1000 BC. Amos the First is going to defeat the Hyksos. The guy named Amunhotep the first, which means Amun is pleased. He's going to be the first to openly live like he was a god. And he's going to build the great temple of Karnak, which was one of the largest buildings of the ancient world. Topmost the first is going to build the first tomb in what's known as the Valley of the Kings. And then Thutmose the second is the wife or the sister of Hatshepsut. And it depends on the story. Uh, Thutmose II marries his wife and his sister, or his stepsister. Eh, the story gets kind of weird here. But Hatshepsut is going to overthrow the son of Thutmose II, and Hatshepsut is going to be the pharaoh of Egypt. And when she overthrows her stepson, uh, she's going to begin dressing as a man, and she's going to live as a god. She is a pharaoh. D uh, not drawings, but carvings of Hatshepsut show her with a beard and men's clothing. And the reason she had, she's depicted with a beard is because in ancient Egypt, having a beard was a sign of power. Eventually, she will be deposed by her stepson, uh, Thutmose III. And Thutmose III is going to try and destroy any record of his stepmom. It's actually been, and I think, about the last 25 years that we realized how powerful Hatshepsut was. Now, moving on from there, uh, we have to talk about Amenhotep IV. Because Amenhotep IV, he's probably the most important thing to come out of the New Kingdom. Uh, he's going to rule, rule from 1379 to 1362 BC. And he's going to redo or recreate the religion of the Egyptians with the help of his wife, Nefertiti. First of all, he's going to rename himself. Instead of Amenhotep, he's going to become known as Akhenaten. And he calls himself Akhenaten because the new god he creates is named Aten. And Aten is supposed to be a combination of the gods Amon and Ra. And Akhenaten means he who serves Aten or he who is worthy of Aten. But what's different about this religion? First of all, it's monotheistic. Aton is the only god that is recognized by Amenhotep. The worship of other gods does continue, but Akhenaten, he, he wants everybody to worship Aton. He's also going to move the capital from the city of Thebes to a city called Tel El Armada. Amarna, not Amarna, but Amarna. And this was in the middle of the desert. 
Now, there are a lot of questions why he does this. The biggest reason he does it is to weaken the power that the priests have. Akhenaten, or Amenhotep IV, wants to be able to control the entire government. And he thinks, if, if I declare myself the head of this new religion and make everybody, order everybody to follow it, that people would do it. And this period is known as the Amarna Revolution. Uh, Akhenaten, or Amenhotep IV, he's very unpopular and he's actually going to be murdered in a coup. He's stabbed in the back. Now, his daughter's husband is named King Tutankhamun. And King Tutankhamun is arguably the most famous of these ancient Egyptians. Now, why is he so popular? Why is he so well known? It's because King Tut, he, first of all, he undoes everything that Akhenaten did. He reverses all the changes, he gets rid of the religion, and then he's also so famous just because he's famous. He's like the Kardashian of ancient Egypt. His tomb was discovered in 1922 by a British explorer slash tomb raider named Howard Carter. And it's discovered that King Tut's tomb was almost 100% intact. So the British and the Egyptian scientists and historians were able to learn more from King Tut than any other fairy. For example, it was discovered that King Tut suffered from scoliosis. He had a bad leg. Uh, he died somewhere in his late teens or early 20s. And most likely, he died from massive trauma to his leg. And it's thought that it was probably a, um, a chariot accident. But King Tut's famous just for being King Tut, not because he did anything particularly great. Now, what happens to the New Kingdom? In the mid-8th century, so in the 900s BC, the Kingdom of Assyria is going to invade Egypt. The Assyrians are the same ones that took out Babylonia from the last lecture. And the Assyrians are going to take over Egypt they destroy Egypt's power as a civilization, but they don't actually stay in Egypt for very long. And Egypt continues to exist after the invasion. And Egypt still exists today, but never does Egypt regain the power or prestige that they had during the period. Now there's a video at the end of this. I can't play it for you because of the way the recording information or the recording program works. But I do suggest that you watch this it's about the Valley of the Kings, and it will show you what the inside of a tomb looks like. And this guy actually goes into King Tut's tomb and shows you around. It's a pretty good video, and it's only a couple minutes long, so I think you will enjoy it. Um, for the next video, I'm going to talk about Judaism and the Hebrew people. So do make sure that you watch the second video of this week. But until then, we'll talk to you later. Have a good day.